Greetings, world. Welcome to my second podcast. This is Eve Starr, and today I will be talking about art and the role of art in culture, as well as the astrological discipline. And you can say that the role of art and the role of the visible are related, in particular with the astrological discipline, given that our foundations are primarily observational. We are viewing a spectacular, ever-present, always-changing natural phenomena, and that is where we start, every single one of us. That is our starting place as astrologers. My podcast today is dedicated to my dear friend, Lisa from Seattle. I lived with Lisa in, oh gosh, (laughs) 2012, 13, 14, and a little teeny bit of 2015. And Lisa is the person who most closely witnessed the birth of Evening Star Maps. And there are many other things that are very special about Lisa, but I will say that first because that is deeply special to my heart. And Lisa put a request on my Facebook page a few days ago for another podcast, and nothing gets me more excited to talk about these things than when people are curious and interested, and I'm so appreciative for that request. And so I'm here tonight creating this podcast for Lisa and for all of my friends who listen to this. I am so appreciative of your taking the time out to connect with me and to the things that I love and it, what is impressed upon me as very important um, for where we are as a species and as a society in this place and time on planet Earth. This is what I have to give. So thank you. And thank you for those who don't know me yet, who have stumbled across this podcast for listening. I am so grateful to every set of ears out there listening to me now. So welcome. Welcome to this time. And I will be beginning all of my podcasts with an exploration into the observable. I study astrology as a visual conceptual artist, and so I come to this discipline through my eyes, and I find this aspect of astrology largely lacking, and my favorite astrologers are always the ones who illuminate the actual natural phenomena that is the foundation of our work. And I'm driven by this. I'm thrilled by this. I'm so excited about this. And there's so much about it that I don't understand. I can't articulate yet why it is so important, but it is profoundly important. And I wonder if part of the reason why I can't articulate the importance of this is because we don't know yet what is to come. And we don't know yet what is to come in our futures on this planet, and we don't know what is to come when we leave this planet. But what we do know, thank you to science, is that we are made of star stuff. Carl Sagan's quote, The solar wind is the arching beautiful bands of fire and light that burst off of the sun in rolling, roving waves of passion produced by positive and negative charges meeting one another. And their qualities dance and cause this force to explode off of our nuclear sun. And these winds have only very recently had their boundaries discovered by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecrafts that were released in 1977. That is older than I am. These spacecrafts have been in our solar system for over 40 years and around the 40 year mark, they burst through this boundary only previously 
speculated. Uh, we knew that eventually that the solar winds would end, but we didn't know where, and now we do. And the way that these spacecraft were able to detect, there are a lot of ways, and I am not a scientist, but this is one little tidbit about it that I find incredible. The way that they're able to detect the solar winds and also the boundary of the solar winds and the beginning of interstellar space is that every known particle of the periodic table is present in the solar winds. So our sun is at all times bursting forth all of the elements required to make up life. Our sun is truly our great parent. Our sun is mother and father, positive and negative polarities. Our sun is the essence of unity. It is a very beautiful thing. So we know this, um, thanks to science, that we came from the stars and we can extrapolate some level of probability that that is what we will return to. I mean, I... Who knows? Who really knows? But it seems like a pretty high level of probability that on some level we will return there, and there's an inkling in my soul that a soulish, as well as an intellectual, as well as an animal awareness of our location physically in this place is of great significance. It feels good. It feels good to know where you are in time and space. It is not a good feeling to be lost. For those of you who can remember attempting to get from point A to point B before <laughs> smartphones. So this is a little bit about that, but I, I went off. I want to talk more about that later. What I, what I wanted to begin this podcast with is a current discussion on what's going on up there. And particularly for those of you who follow any astrological teacher, they are going to be talking primarily about one thing now and all of the planets changing in relation to it, depending on how often they are teaching, you will hear all of the planets discussed. But for over a year previous and over a year post. It has been and will be discussed the coming conjunction of Pluto and Saturn, which is currently visible. Now, Pluto is not visible, but Saturn is, and Jupiter is, and it is astounding to me to stand beneath it and to consider these things, that the mysticism of astrology is illuminating to us, that my brothers and sisters are perceiving from beyond the veil and all of the cross-referencing where we're all on the same page about this, and it can be cross-referenced through history. One of my favorite astrologers is Rick Levine, and I know he recently either just did or is about to publish a talk that he did several months ago for his paid subscribers about the timeline of these Saturn-Pluto conjunctions and oppositions through history and all of the significant events that unfolded in our collective around those times. And I will post a link to that in this podcast. Everybody's talking about this, and I don't know anybody, even my favorite astrologers who discuss at great length the actual observable reality, are not talking about how to observe it. So if you are in the Northern Hemisphere, this phenomena has been observable for months now and is becoming less and less observable as the sun draws closer to these planets. And we know that the sun is not drawing closer to these planets. This is the orbit of the Earth around the sun that is making the sun appear to draw closer to these planets. And it will, <laughs> funny enough, be precisely conjunct. The sun will be precisely conjunct Saturn and Pluto on the day that Saturn and Pluto precisely conjunct one another. So we will not see this, but you can glance at the sun, if you will. I recommend doing that through sunglasses or near dawn and dusk, and you will know that behind the sun is Saturn and then Pluto. And along with these planets are also going to be Mercury and 
Jupiter. Now, Mercury is only one degree past Saturn and Pluto at the moment of conjunction. So Mercury is very, very, very close. And you will see in your imagination, in your mind's eye, you will see Mercury first, then Saturn, then Pluto. Additionally, the asteroid Ceres will be there as well. And then Jupiter will be at nine degrees of Capricorn. So Jupiter will be the one visible planet. However, you will not see Jupiter in the night sky. You will see Jupiter in the morning sky, but only if you have a very clear view of the horizon. So as we approach this date, and we are T minus two months, we are under two months until January 12th, 2020, when this conjunction happens. And it's still observable. Saturn in the sky and Jupiter in the sky are still observable in the Northern Hemisphere, but they are getting less and less so as we move closer and closer to that date. So I highly recommend stepping outside as soon as you can at dusk, and you will see Jupiter first because Jupiter is brighter than Saturn. Jupiter, however, is also going to disappear first as the sun encroaches on Jupiter's light, and then you will see Saturn appear as it gets darker. And Jupiter will be very close to the western horizon, and Saturn will be up and to the left a little bit from the horizon. And Saturn is at 16 degrees of Capricorn. Pluto is at 21 degrees of Capricorn. So there's still quite some degrees of separation there. But if, if you were to be able to see Pluto, or if you have a telescope, then it's not very much. It's, you know, one of your fingers visibly would fit between these two planets. So they're very close. But when they conjunct, everything will be at 22, almost 23 degrees of Capricorn. So that is what is happening in our sky right now in as far as this very important upcoming date is concerned. And we also have, okay, right now, this is super important. So beautiful. We have a diamond in the sky right now. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. We'll see if I put that bit in. We have a diamond in the sky right now. And what I mean by that is from Earth's point of view, the configuration of the planets around us creates the shape of a diamond, which you could also say creates two shapes. It creates a perfect triangle inside of a circle, and then a isosceles triangle, where only two sides are equal, and they are touching. There are opposing planets on either side going through the middle, and everything else is harmonious trine or sextile. A trine is 120 degrees, a sextile is 60 degrees. We have both Jupiter and Venus in the night sky right now. So it is not just Jupiter. Now, I'm not seeing Venus because there are a lot of trees where I am, and Venus moves very quickly. And so Venus has not been this visible up until recently. But depending on your horizon, how many trees you have and how much you can see past those trees, you may be able to observe Venus beside Jupiter right now in the evening sky. And it is a very beautiful and powerful sight. Venus and Jupiter are the benefic planets. So in astrology, they have always been considered beneficial. We have a more nuanced understanding. And it's not just that modern day astrology doesn't like to talk about good and evil. It's that good and evil are crude explanations for the situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, the Tao says, how can you know if a thing is good or bad? Because a good thing could bring about a bad outcome, and a bad thing could bring about a good outcome. So these planets that tend to have a certain kind of feel when they're around and when they are making certain kinds of aspects that have a certain kind of feel. What we say about trines, sextiles, as well as Saturn, as well, not Saturn, as well as Jupiter and Venus is that they have harmonious energy and that they tend to bring about ease. And then the other aspects that were in ancient astrology considered malefic which are squares and oppositions, and the malefic planets, which are Saturn and Mars traditionally, and Pluto has been scooped right up with that in modern times, that are considered malefic. Now we say that they are challenging and that they also bring about structure. They bring about results. 
So challenges can be difficult. Challenges can be required to make something happen that you want to make happen. Ease can be very wonderful. And there's a time and place for harmony. Ease and too much of it also leads to laziness, gluttony, inequality. A lot of people use the word energy and that's sufficient. But I really like to be more specific about it and say that these are like feelings and they're like songs. So when you hear a song, it gives you a certain feeling. You take that in through your sense of hearing and it goes into your emotional being. It goes into your heart and it makes you feel certain things. Songs make you feel certain things. And so do the movement of the planets. And that's where we get this idea of the harmony of the spheres, the music of the spheres that I am probably going to at least reference in every podcast because that is the way that I am experiencing this thing, that there are certain days that you wake up that have a certain feeling. And so you don't know what's going to happen that day, but you know the rhythm of the day, you know the cadence, you know the emotions, you know the tension in the air, you know the excitement in the air, you know the boredom in the air, you know the thrill in the air. Whatever is going on, you feel it. Whether or not you're paying attention to the movement of the planets, we all seem to be perceiving these similar feelings that are kind of in the air. And that's what astrology is built on. And it's not that simple. It's more complex than that. We perceive certain things collectively and we perceive certain things individually. And there's crossover between both of them. Some things we perceive both collectively and individually. Some things only individuals perceive. Some things are perceived on the collective level far more than they're perceived on an individual level. But then that doesn't even make sense because all individuals are part of the collective. And the collective is part of all individuals. But each individual has a different celestial anatomy. We were born all with a different, very unique, singular planetary print. And that causes us to experience these movements differently. And it is, it's like each part of the song is its own part, but together it makes the whole. And each of us are playing a different instrument in this song called life. And the planets are included in that. And the planets are strongly influential in that. So it's visual and it's auditory. And my work, though I do work with musicians and will work with musicians even more so in the future, that's a very important part of my work because I do paint live with music as has become a beautiful phenomena in recent decades where art forms are coming together very much so in our time. And a lot of visionary artists paint with music and bring together these two art forms that not always, but at so many times in our history have been very separate and Each one informs the other. So this is a very powerful art collaboration that is happening across the collective in this time. And I am pleased to be taking part in that more in the future and we'll certainly have more to say about it. But this podcast today is specifically about the role of art in society and the role of art and the visual in the discipline of astrology. Because you can only talk about what you know, right? And I have not spent the past six years painting with musicians. I've not spent the past six years on that collaboration. I have spent a small amount of time on that, and I do have a small amount of things to say about it, and I am looking forward to the future when I do that more. But what I have spent the last six years doing is translating what I receive from observing the movement of the planets, translating it into images. And for a long time, it was very difficult, nearly impossible for me to put anything into words, which was strange because I am a writer. I've always been a writer. I, in fact, have a degree in writing and technical writing. I got a degree in technical writing because I'm a creative writer And I wanted to understand more of the mechanics of language, not because I actually wanted to be a technical writer and much to my parents' chagrin. I have not become a technical writer, nor did I ever intend to. I wanted to know and understand language. And when I started painting, it went away. 
And that has been very challenging for me. I was in a different part of my brain than the language sector. And now I am endeavoring to put words to what I have explored and experienced and received over the past six years. And that's a lot of what these podcasts are about. And I know, I feel in my feeler the importance of the visible. And I have not studied, I've listened to a lot of astrologers and I've read a little bit, but astrology to me is not just a scholastic discipline. Astrology is it's a transmission. It comes from one human to another. And because of that reason, I take in the majority of my astrological ed- education through teachings through either podcast or through videos. I have not had the great fortune yet to sit in fellowship with astrologers in person and learn from them and receive from them. I'm also looking forward to that. But the vast majority of my study has been, aside from listening to those few key astrologers whom I love and and am forever grateful for, the vast majority of my studies have been sitting with the astrological chart itself. And I look at the mundane chart, which is the chart of the moment, the chart of right now. And I look at that every day and I look at it all throughout the day. And I have for six years and I look at my own chart and I do readings. And so I look at the charts of other people and I look at the charts of my friends and I look at the charts of the people who come to me. Also, I study ephemerides, which are tables of the position of the planets that we have extending back for thousands and thousands of years. I study astronomy, observational astronomy, many various chart techniques. So basically, what I'm doing is looking at and working with the raw data. And so... I have a very fundamental understanding of astrology. I like to look at it. I like to look at it and I like to go outside and say, okay, this is east and this is west and this is up and this is down and there is Jupiter. It's right where the chart says it should be. And this is at its very most fundamental essence. The astrological chart is a map and you can use it. You could use it if you were at sea to figure out which way you should point your boat. This is fundamentally observable. This is fundamentally practical. This is fundamentally not only useful, but useful to the point of survival. And we've forgotten it because of electronics. And I am convinced that the importance of being able to observe the movement of the planets and the location of the stars is not diminished by our technological affluence and by the fact that we don't actually need it anymore in order to get from point A to point B. That is not the only important thing. That's not the only important thing. It is important to a human animal. It is important to a human soul to feel, to understand on every level where we are located. It just feels like a massage in some part of my being that I can't call my body and I can't call it my mind. Perhaps it's my soul. But to study the astrological chart and then to step outside and to, and to see its precision in my actual experience is thrilling And I'm going to spend the rest of my life illuminating why it is important for other people who don't just naturally have this, this, I was going to say strange, and then I was going to say random, but this particular obsession, we all, everybody who's here, we have a thing and we have a thing because it's important and it's important for the collective. And this is what I was given. I was given the gift of measurement. I can measure with my eyes. And everything that I draw and everything that I paint, I do freehand. I never use compasses. I don't use straight edges. I don't use protractors. One time out of a hundred, I will use a straight edge, but that's generally when I have a deadline and I'm going to sell it and it's a commission (laughs) and, and I'll be, 
I'll be really sorry if I get that line wrong. And I only do it when I absolutely have to. And the reason for that is not some sense of arrogance. And it's not just because I can. The reason for that is that when I focus at that level, when I tune into the piece of artwork at that level, then it becomes alive because I have the gift of measurement. I know when it's right. And I don't have it if I'm not paying attention and if I'm not focused. And when I'm paying attention and when I'm focused at that level, then the thing that I'm creating comes alive. And that is what makes my work different. And I'm not saying that other artists aren't alive, but I don't know any other artist who handcrafts natal charts. That's not true. There was one woman, and I don't know if she still does. I'm going to find out if she still does it and link her to this podcast if she does, because she was actually from Asheville. She doesn't live there anymore, and she inspired me. And I want to give credit to her because our work is visually very, very different, but she did commission work for people with their astrological charts. And when I saw it, I was just enraptured. It, I just felt like I came home. Anyhow, and I'd love to sit and talk with her about this. What this is for me is an actual talisman. It is a magically created tool that can be used in ritual, in prayer, in ceremony, and in magic. And it can be used that way because the thing in and of itself is powerful. This is a precisely accurate visual representation of a moment in time. It's not always a natal chart, but in my mind, it is always a natal chart. And a natal chart means a birth chart, because even if it's for a moment in time, or if it's for a relationship, you know, it's when we fell in love, it's when we met, it's when the moment that I started my business, those are all births. Those are all beginnings, whether or not it's an actual physical human birth through the body of a woman. And a birth moment is the moment of greatest potency. It is the moment when a being comes from another dimension into this one. When a being has enough cohesive organization to move from another dimension, we don't know where, and into this one actually survive the journey and then begin to grow and change and evolve and take form and become something living, dynamic, unique. This is the moment of our greatest power and potential. And that is what the natal chart represents. So in and of itself is powerful. Even if all you have is a printout that you printed out yourself or from your astrologer, it is powerful and you can use it when you pray. You can use it when you ritual. And I experience this and I'm confounded by it. I'm humbled by it. I'm in awe of it. And it is my work in this life. It is my great honor in this life to take that visual representation and to craft the most beautiful piece of fine art with my bare hands, without tools, that I possibly can from it for on behalf of another. And this can be used as commemoration. It can be enjoyed simply for its beauty because it is beautiful. And it can also be used for magic. It can also be used for reference. So if you are into astrology, if you really love it, if you follow it in a way that it is a hobby, not necessarily your career. So it's not something you're thinking about all the time, but it's something that you really enjoy discussing from time to time with people in your life. And you like talking about their birth chart and your birth chart and, oh, where's your Jupiter and what's on your IC and I can't remember. And then you're rifling through your papers for the printout or you're searching through your email for the digital image that your astrologer sent you instead of that, which is what we all do. Instead of that, you have a beautiful piece of fine art on your wall that is reference accurate. And you can walk up to it and you can go, there, there's Jupiter at the moment of my birth, right there. I want to talk about that, about 
what that means when I say where Jupiter was at the moment of your birth, because we can tie this into right now and then you can really understand it by going outside and observing nature. So if you go outside at dusk, it's going to be dusk and depending on where you are in the Northern Hemisphere, it's going to be dusk and an hour or two, maybe three after dusk and you won't be able to see it anymore. I don't even know if you can see it at three hours after dusk now. But if you locate Jupiter and you locate Saturn, and it's really important to locate Saturn because Saturn is closer to where Saturn and Pluto will be, January 12th, 2020. So you need to locate Saturn and you know that Saturn is in the sign of Capricorn. And that is a reference to the fixed stars. That's how we know where the planets are because the planets move and the stars don't. Now they do, but not over the course of a human lifetime. I mean, not even, they move a minuscule amount of a degree over the course of a human lifetime. So in terms of the universe and of certainly of the solar system, they move. But in terms of our life, they don't move. So we can map the movement of the planets against the fixed stars. And so Capricorn is referencing a constellation that allows us to see where these things are in any moment of time down to a very precise, exact point. So if you go and you look and you see Jupiter and then you look above and to the left of Jupiter, well, above and south of Jupiter, you will see Saturn. And when you spot Saturn, you know that is where Saturn, Pluto, Mercury, and the sun will be on January 12th. I mean, the sun's going to be very close at the beginning of January. So you can go ahead and start visualizing this. So it's January 12th and it's broad daylight and you go outside and you are aware out of the corner of your eye because you're not going to look at it because it will blind you. We all are taught this as soon as we are taught language, which is another fascinating thing. Maybe I'll link one of my favorite articles about that. Don't look at the sun. Never look at the sun. It's the cardinal rule of all the planet. Do not look at that star. (laughs) So don't look at it. But you glance at it and you recognize, you become aware of where the sun is and you know that all these planets are behind it. And then you can remember this moment if you're listening to this podcast and if you will please go outside and look at that precise spot in the sky, less than two months from now, the sun will be there at that spot in the sky, which is in reference to the constellation of Capricorn. And that will give you a perceivable in your animal being and also in your consciousness, a perceivable awareness of how much the earth has moved in its orbit around the sun between now and then. That's what that distance is. That is what that distance is. This is a very, very beautiful, very powerful thing. And I am incorporating in my work, I am incorporating the visual observable aspects of astronomy and astrology with the nature of visual conceptual fine art. And those two together, perhaps is because they're, they are there. It's just that no one else is pointing it out. They're there and they've always been there, those two things. And tying them together, I'm finding such this powerful fusion that I came to realize that this could be used in prayer and in magic. And my experience has been, and I'll be, you know, you can take this as a metaphor or you can take this literal, and that depends on your practice. But even as a metaphor, it's powerful and different people have different practices. You may pray, you may do magic, you may do ritual, you may do ceremony, you may do none of those things, but you tune into nature and you move according to how your inner voice and your inner compass tells you to move. And that is the best way. And the best way is to combine whatever your spiritual discipline is with that inner voice and I have, I have found that when we are listening to the inner voice, when we are tuned in to the inner compass, that we are actually moving in accordance with the planets. And sort of the difference is, if you are allowing these forces and moving with these forces, then you can thrive. And if you are fighting against them, then you can struggle And that is not a hard and fast rule. I'm not saying when you thrive, it's because you're moving in harmony. And when you struggle, it's because you are rebelling. It's not a hard and fast rule. Life is not that simple. 
and all suffering is not a result of our action, but a lot of suffering is a result of our action, our actions or our inaction. And there are aspects of our lives. If we have the privilege and God be grateful enough to apprehend it and to use it well, if you have the privilege and then to use it for others. And so when we combine the inner knowing of the intuition with our spiritual practice, and then we align it with the actual position of the planets, you can do it on your couch, in your pajamas, and watch what moves, watch what happens. And you can draw a circle and put on your regalia and light all the incense and the fire and have all of the tools present. And you can perform your ritual of high magic with great ceremony and drama. And you do it at the wrong time and either nothing's going to happen or you're not going to get the desired result. Timing is everything. And that is the essence of astrology. Timing is everything. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, incredible, fascinating, amazing thing. What was it Steve Judd the other day said? And I don't remember who he was quoting, but he said, millionaires don't use astrologers. Billionaires do. And there, there is a long history of royalty and of government consulting astrology and also of astrologers and those who seem to have knowledge that is beyond the ordinary perception of them being persecuted. And this is why they wouldn't be persecuted if they were just crackpots. That's not how this thing works. And we all know it. So I want to say a little bit more about the role of art in culture and in particular Western culture, and because of where I am and where I am a professional artist, Southern culture. I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and Asheville is an artist town. People come here to experience the art in this town and the music in this town. They come here to see live musicians and street musicians, that are of high concentration and high caliber. And you can find music any day or night of the week in this town. And artists, there's the River Arts District, and there are galleries downtown, and there are artists on the street, and there are outdoor artist markets. And that's where I work. I work at the outdoor artist market. And you can visit their galleries and tour their galleries. If you're visiting Asheville, you can find a time to tour living artists work and their workspace and their galleries. And they'll talk to you about their process. And you can go to the outdoor market and you can talk to artists, the actual artists who are selling their actual paintings. And you can buy their paintings and you can talk to them about their art and why they do it and how they do it and what it is to be a living artist in this time. And you can go find buskers on the street who are making art, who are painting, who are making music, who are doing crystal singing bowls and playing spoons and all all sorts of different acts and performances, vaudeville performances. You can see theater here. You can see people painted all in silver standing still on the street as statues. There is a wide variety of expression in this town, and that's why I'm here. It, For me, Asheville is a womb. It is an artist's womb. If you want to birth yourself as an artist, come to Asheville. And there are a lot of people here who come as rudimentary artists who don't have a lot of skill. They haven't had a lot of practice and they start here and, and Asheville will cultivate their work if they put the work in and you can watch so many artists over the years here progress and improve in their work because this place doesn't say you have to be at this level before you can be an artist. It just says, come and be creative. And there is value in that. And I'm going to talk about what that value is because I contend that in this time and in this place that we are fucked 
without creative thinking. For example, I have an aptitude for microbiology and I'm fascinated by disease. And I have sort of a long-term notion that once I become a successful artist, that I'm going to go back to school for microbiology and I'm going to work for the CDC and I'm going to study disease. I'm going to study viruses and bacteria and how they operate. I'm fascinated with that level of life. And I will be coming at that from somebody who knows how to think creatively in so many different directions, not just how to make art, but how to make a living out of making art. And whether or not I actually do this, whether or not my life actually takes me on this path, the point is this, I have the potential because of the way my brain works, I have the potential to go into a field like that and make breathtaking, world-changing discoveries. And it's happened in the past. Look at Leonardo da Vinci and people who take their artistic creative mind and apply it to another discipline. They're looking at it from another perspective that nobody else in that discipline has. And we are at a time and place where we are in crisis on so many levels and in so many sectors. And if we cannot bring creative thinking to those crises, then we have a lot less potential for working through them. And I am so over art being namby pambied and pat on the head and treated like a hobby and of less import than all of the rest of the sectors of society. Because what needs to happen is the other sectors of society bring in this level of thinking into what they're doing, actually accepting artists rather than keeping us out. Because you know what? If I was funded, if I had money, if I was able to move forward in my business real quickly, then I could get on to microbiology more quickly. And maybe I could do something that would actually change things on that level. And that's just, again, one example. There are 8 billion people on the planet, and it's a small percentage, but it's a goodly um, number of people are artistically minded out of that 8 billion. And if we support them, then what can they bring to the table? A lot, not just a painting. And I'm not trying to downplay painting at all. I'm highly passionate about it. And I'm going to talk more about that as well in a minute. But I think that I really wanted to start with the importance of creative thinking in our culture and in our society and in our situation right now, planet Earth 2019. When I was a teenager, my dad showed me and my sister Dead Poet Society. I remember sitting in the living room with him and with my sister watching Dead Poets Society, which at that moment became my favorite movie. And I've never seen a movie that tops it to this day. It's my favorite movie. That was over half a lifetime ago. And my dad has this really funny way of getting profoundly moved by movies, by stories. It's very human. And there will be a moment, it's the pinnacle of the movie, you know, and he will do everything in his power to help us understand how meaningful and beautiful it is. And it, that usually involves pausing and rewinding and then and saying, did you catch that? And then he'll play it again. And then he'll go, did you catch that? He'll rewind it again and play it again. And then go, did you catch that? And then, and then he'll talk about it and then he'll discuss it with it. It's like in the middle of the most powerful moment of the movie. And we're like, dad, can we just keep watching the movie? And he's like, but you need to understand how important that is. And he'll repeat it. And then he'll, he'll, he has the line memorized and he'll stand up and he'll just act it out like he's Robin Williams. And I remember him specifically doing that with this movie. And he was right. It was really important. And it remains with me to this day. So here's the line. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. And medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, 
love. These are what we stay alive for. To quote from Whitman, O oh me, O oh life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good amid these, O oh me, O oh life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists, and identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? I imagine that most of the people listening to this podcast have seen Dead Poet Society, and Robin Williams was still alive when I saw it, and for many years after, and he's no longer with us. And if you haven't seen it, and especially if you love Robin Williams, I, I actually implore you to watch that movie sooner rather than later. It's very important. What I also want to implore of you is we all have a different purpose in this life. And we all have an inkling of it, even if it's just an inkling. <laughs> I, I'm just not going to, even though I, I kind of feel the need to, but I'm just, I'm not going to go into my personal struggles and sacrifices and outright loss that I have endured in order to do this. And I'm not successful yet by the culture's standards. I am not successful. And I will be, because I have to be, because this is why I exist. And it's happening now. It's in the process of happening. But by my own standards, I am successful. I own my life. And I am doing what I'm meant to do on this earth. And I have given up an absolutely staggering degree of my personal fulfillment and satisfaction in order to own my life. And it, it won't always be like that, but I will never get those years back. And I don't regret it. Quite on the contrary, I wouldn't trade it. And I am more grateful for the opportunity to do this than I can possibly express. I'm more grateful to those who have supported me than I can possibly express. And there are a lot of people. I'm not well known enough to sell my art for what it's worth. That said, I have sold hundreds and hundreds of pieces of artwork. And I am profoundly, unspeakably grateful. And I am profoundly and unspeakably aware of the dire importance that as many of us as possible pursue our purpose in this life with everything that we have. You may think you don't have enough to do it. You do. You have enough to do it. There is a way. There's always a way to start. And every single day, there becomes more and more of a way. And if you can't do it, you can't do it. And I'm not talking to you. And I know that everybody can't do it. This is a privilege. I am talking to those who have the privilege to be who they are meant to be in this world, for this world. Please do it. Please sacrifice. We can't afford not to have you in it and all the way in it. Come in it with me. Come in it with us. I surround myself with those like me. And there are a lot of us. And that number of people is growing. 
And it is very, very, very hopeful. And if you step out into what you know you're meant to be doing, then your people will come to you. And it won't be easy and it won't be immediate. And it's going to be scary. It's going to be scary. I am not going to sugarcoat it. It's going to be hard. It's going to cost. And it is worth every single sacrifice. It is worth every single sacrifice to know yourself in this way and also to let others know you here. I invite you now to take a moment out of time and step into your imagination. You can close your eyes if you want. You don't need to. This isn't a meditation. It's just a concept for you to allow into your mind and into your being if you so choose. You can relax your body. It helps. It helps everything. And consider in your imagination, in the part of your mind that sees pictures, when your eyes are closed, what would it be like to wake up in the morning every morning and to not have the crashing realization that it's early and it's time to get in the shower and you're not going to be able to eat breakfast before you leave and get in your car and sit in traffic with a Pop-Tart or a bowl of food or a smoothie and drive to your office where you do somebody else's work and dream of who you're meant to be when nobody is looking. What if you didn't do that anymore in the morning? What if you did not wake up with that crashing realization, just what would it feel like if you woke up in the morning, every morning, and you knew you had a lot of work to do and that the day would be full and busy and much was required of you and you didn't know how you were going to get it all done because much is inside of you And it's needed. And now we know about it. You've offered it. You've stepped onto the world stage. And it is as natural as breathing. And you get to get up in the morning. And instantly, as you arrive into consciousness, you arrive into yourself. Into who you are into the thing that you love to do more than anything else. Who it is that you're actually meant to be in this world. Maybe just consider it. Consider that it could be what you want it to be. Yes, it will take work. We're all adults. We know that. We're not getting out of this without working. (laughs) Another way of saying it would be that it will take action and effort and energy, all of which is very human and natural and fulfilling to embody. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. In this moment, I give you my gratitude. I give you my love. I give you my strength. And I believe in you. Until next time. Signing off.